Welcome to Innovation and Leadership. I'm Jess Larson. Today on the show, we've got Rourke Denver. A lot of people sometimes, you know, do see us as the the movies or the TV shows, which often show just the shooting and looting and that good stuff, which, you know, we're certainly capable of. There's there's a lot of depth of, of character and personality and teamwork and, 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 and true brotherhood that exists there that uh, is probably harder to unpack and explain to people, but is, is probably a better subject. This is another episode of our Innovation and Leadership series where we interview pro athletes, world-class musicians, CEOs, Hollywood filmmakers, and a wide variety of other high achievers. Also, I want to talk to you about one of our show's sponsors. I met these guys back on episode six. CEO Zach Smith was telling me all about starting a skateboard company and how much he hated doing the bookkeeping uh, for a skateboard shop and how he really uh, got led to start this business, Bookly, that's a hybrid combining bookkeeping software and human services. And I'll tell you why I let him become a sponsor. It's because I use their service now. I don't love paying 50 bucks an hour for bookkeepers to do stuff that I know software could do way, way cheaper, but uh, I don't love bookkeeping at all. So I want a real live human who knows what they're talking about to help me with the stuff I don't understand. Uh, Probably the straw that broke the camel's back for me though, the thing that put me over the top was that they could do my taxes and payroll also. Um, So totally suggest checking them out. Go to their website, bookly.co and check out their flat rates. I've been super happy with them. So now on to today's episode. Thanks for making time. Oh, thanks for having me, brother. I'm psyched. So, um, you know, me and my friends are, are pretty familiar with you from uh, the movie Act of Valor. But um, for, for those who, who aren't as familiar with you can, you, can you give us a little bit of some career highlights and then maybe some of the, the fun stuff on the side, the New York Times bestselling books and some of those other things? Yeah, absolutely. The the nightmare of doing Act of Valor is that uh, everyone associates, you know, you with the one um, entertainment piece you did, piece you did compared to the <laughs> twenty year uh, career, thirteen years of uh, of chasing savages and bad country and leading troops and and then approaching twenty years of service. It's it's uh, I say that totally in jest and own it and I'm fine with it. But it is funny when people are like, oh yeah, he's an actor. I was like, I, I did some other work too. Um, so uh, this one time, well, I, this I, one time. Yeah, I did something yeah. else i um I, you know i grew up in the bay area california athlete my whole life um you know wrestled with uh academics but not because of intellectual capacity it was more because of focus and and just kind of finding my stride and in, in more um you know tactile and getting my hands on things than than sitting in the classroom but I, i've been a big reader my whole life that was a gift for my dad uh and my brother dad and i are all just you know vor- voracious readers and that's been the real um you know i think educational gift that i took through all my actual studies um, I played lacrosse in college up at Syracuse University back when um, they were a, a, a genuine every year powerhouse and got to compete for championships and, and be in the mix there. And, and then my, uh, my senior year of college, having no idea, I was, I was a fine arts major, so I'm, I'm not a math and science guy. I'm much more an art and literature uh, philosophy type um, mindset and person. So that, that's what I studied and, and having no idea what I want to do next. I, I, I still wanted to play rough and, and go get an adver- adventures. And I was reading Winston Churchill, uh, at the time and something about this book he wrote really connected me to the idea of service and that military service, particularly as an officer, uh, would probably be the right fit. And it felt like a calling. And so, um, I knew I wanted to serve as an officer in the military. I did a bunch of research of all the, you know, all, all the major units and, and particularly the special operations forces. Cause there's a, a draw there. And, and I think the end state statistic of 80 some odd percent of the people that try seal training, don't see the finish line sound like the right odds to me. And, uh, and I found a home. So I got very blessed in my timing. You know, I ended up at, uh, uh, the SEAL teams pre 9-11. So I got to do deploying and a lot of, uh, a lot of time, you know, in that, that era of that brotherhood, which was a, a, a kind of a blessing to have that pre-war experience because it was very, very different. And then, um, 9-11 kicked off on one of my deployments and, and, you know, needless to say the history from there is, is, is relatively well known. So deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, East and West Africa, um, and then finished my active duty career running training uh, at our SEAL compound there in, in Coronado. So I ran everything from the basic level uh, through Hell Week and that stuff, and then all those phases of training, and then kind of end my active time as the executive officer in charge of uh, advanced training. So all the polished schools for the SEALs, hand-to-hand fighting, sniper, communications, diving, language, um, those programs that kind of put the, put, the, put the sharp edge on, on the boys before they you know, go do their job. Um, in that time is when Act of Valor 
we got put on orders to go make that movie uh, and try and authentically represent our community and do it in such a way that it'd get, um, you know, good, good kind of press, but also uh, more young lions wanting to pursue our line of work. And, and, and that proved to be uh, uh, very effective in doing so. And, and then when I came off active duty, I'd gone back to grad school. I knew it was time to get out. I want to start a family. And I'd, I'd, I'd done all the things I want to do within the teams. I've, I've stayed in the reserve, so I'm still a commander uh, doing reserve time. But uh, yeah, I wrote my first book, Damn Few, uh, Making the Modern Seal Warrior, which is, is you know, a little bit more biographical. And then, um, uh, but, but it has a lot of higher ideals, you know, compared to a lot of seal books, it's not a lot of, and I, you know, I say this humbly, it's not a lot of, this is what I did. This is who I killed or how many people I killed. And I'm not, I'm not taking away from the guys who did it. Those are all great books. And, 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 and most, most of the boys have represented the community really well, but really want to talk about the, you know, the higher ideals, what we believe in, why we serve, uh, what impact it has and, and how it affects the families and our lives and, um, you know, the passion and kind of intensity we bring to that. Uh, my second book, Worth Dying For, is uh, a, a just kind of, a, you know, another piece of they're really more essays than a than a, you know, narrative arc through the story. But just kind of talking about where we are as a country and a people and a military and um, some of the things I learned from that. And then, then most recently, I've, I've launched um, my own kind of leadership, human performance, culture uh, brand, I guess, called Ever Onward, which uh, you can go to RourkeDenver.com, find me there, and a lot of new stuff percolating there. So it, it's been an adventure. It continues, and uh, I've, I've had a lot of fun. I feel lucky. Yeah. So are you thinking about doing anything cool with your life at some point? Like, are you going to... You know, at some point, of ambition will strike, and I'll get off the couch, but, uh, you know, it hasn't hit yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, <clears throat> you know... I imagine, you know, being on Conan and, and all the speaking to across the world for corporate America and, and all these opportunities, there's probably some questions you get pretty often. Um, maybe let's go a different direction though. What, what's a question you wish people asked you more that they don't ask you? Uh, um, you know, I think when it comes to seal experience and my, my time in the seals, which is probably the, you know, the, the, the subject that people want to unpack and spend time on the most, um, that there's so much focus on, um, you know, what, what makes a seal? Why are you guys special on the battlefield? You know, what are the workout routines do? What are you eating and all these different things? And it's, it, it really becomes much more nuanced stuff. And I know you've spent time around our community and you, you've spent time around, um, the folks that do this job. And, and I think what you find is a tremendous, um, you know, confidence combined with intellect, combined with, you know, tremendous curiosity and desire to go um, experience things, right? And so I think a lot of people sometimes, you know, do see us as the the movies or the TV shows, which often show just the shooting and looting and that good stuff, which, you know, we're certainly capable of. There's there's a lot of depth of, of character and personality and teamwork and, 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 and true brotherhood that exists there that uh, is probably harder to unpack and explain to people, but is, is probably a better subject. You know, I mean, I think um, culture is such a huge kind of brand topic right now, and I'm kind of working on some more culture based um, speaking and talking and, and digging into that, because if you ask me what makes the SEALs, you know, capable on the battlefield or, or some of the best operators in the world, it, it really is the culture. I mean, I can frankly, we can teach an orangutan to shoot effectively. That that's Those are those are X's and O's, and we know how to train people to do that. It's the culture that leads, you know, our guys to solve problems, to seek out, uh, you know, new technology, skill sets, and um, really just keep pursuing what, what needs to you know, be learned or acquired to go do the job well. And, and, and those are the things that I think become, to me, more interesting than, you know, how many push-ups do you guys do in training or, you know, how cold was the water? And it, and it was cold and we did a lot of push-ups, but, but uh, it's, uh, it's a lot deeper than that when we do the job. Yeah. Um, you know, you and I were chatting for a minute before getting going today, um, specifically about one of the subjects that I feel like is underrepresented when people are talking about your community. And um, it's this idea of, of selflessness. Like, uh, you certainly have reputations as being hard chargers and, and, uh, willing to deal with uncertainty. But, um, what I feel like gets underemphasized is this, this concept of, um, there's something bigger than me and not just like cliche patriotism or something sure, uh, sure. Of, of like the stuff that rolls off the tongue, but like the, the, like, I don't know how to make it not sound cliche, but the, like, 
the genuineness of like, you know, these guys aren't just willing to give their life to save each other's life. They're willing to give their life so that my family can keep having the lifestyle my family has, and they don't even know me. Um, can you can you talk about how that gets baked into the osmosis of of your world? Yeah, it's. I mean, you're you're hitting on the head that there's um, that it's that it's real, that it's authentic, and and the idea of service. Um, you, you know, everyone that serves has really decided to take a special step and, and put themselves in a special category of, of, of citizen and, and frankly, of human being. Um, I think the folks that gravitate towards our community uh, live at the far fringe and extreme of that just because of the, the, the inherent nature of the job we're going to go do. Our, our, our teams are not designed um, to go run medical outreach programs or build bridges and, and, and um, you know, help with infrastructure and things like that. We're, we're there to hunt evil and to go meet evil uh, in their den and, and, and in their grounds and, and, and keep them there and keep them at bay so we don't experience it here at home. Um, I think the thing that you've seen and that, that I agree is, is also the case is, is there's, there's just a lot of different layers to that. Like if you, if you, if you go to, um, you know, slice into that concept, it, it's layered. So you have this, you know, overarching desire um, that probably lives in a very personal and in some ways, this will be counter to what we're going to get to, but in some ways a selfish um, experience in that, you know, I want to be a SEAL. It takes a tremendous amount to get through the program and commitment and focus and drive and resilience to become a SEAL. And there's a, there's a large part of that, even though you want to serve that, that is selfish. You want to be a SEAL. You want to join that team and, 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 um, you're willing to, to sacrifice what it takes to get there. Um, and then when you get into it, these other things grow and, and, and usually it's a desire to serve and, and a very honorable thing to go do that. Um, and I, and I hope I'm highlighting that well, but it's like, there's this personal desire that we all have, I think, to perform at the highest level and be member of, of, of one of the true top teams. And so that, that, that's probably internal. And, and then you have all these external forces that, that become your master. You have the master of the U S military and, and how you're going to behave, dress, act, perform, and execute your duties. You have the senior political leadership of the country um, and the civilian leadership that's going to guide uh, the energies of those, um, you know, those requests and what, what's going to be called upon to go do and, and to give you the green light to go do the job. Uh, you have your family or you, you obviously feel very passionate about and, and, and want to make sure they're safe. And, and, and in this strange way, this, this tremendous equal balance of, of knowing that the family that lives next to me, to the right of me, and in every town USA is also every bit as important. And that, that you know, there's only a few of us that are willing to raise our hands and say, you know, send me, I'll, I'll go into harm's way and I'll take the hit. I'll, 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 you know, even go to the ultimate sacrifice to make sure we enjoy what we enjoy here. And, and so the layers of that service is, is very, very special. And I, and I think it takes, you know, just takes a lot of humility, I think, to do that and do that well. And, it, and it's it's almost always authentic. I mean, you again, you've been around our 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 troops and, and our folks and there is an absolutely staggering amount of authentic humility for some very, very talented people that probably, um, you know, wouldn't be begrudged if they were beating their chest and, and screaming from the mountaintops. And it's just not, it's not something our folks do. We got, you know, one or two folks every, every generation that probably, uh, uh, has the, you know, arrogance gets the best of them, but it's rare. It's a, it's a rare guy in our community that, that is arrogant and not humble and not, um, you know, a quiet professional. I think, you know, right in the books and the movies and the TV shows, I think have clouded that a little bit. I think a lot of people have done it the right way. There's a few people that haven't done it the wrong way. My, my take on that, when people ask me about, it, they're like, well, you know, you're, you're the quiet professionals, but you guys are writing books and doing movies. And, you know, that runs counter that there's no way you, it sounds, you know, uh, like it's, it's hypocrisy to, to do those things. And my only, the only thing I maintain, I'm careful not to throw rocks in a, in a glass house, but is that if we circle the wagons and we don't share what we've learned, if we don't talk about these things we've seen around the world in a more, you know, kind of intense, naked, stripped down, you know, almost visceral way, well, th then we've, we've done in my mind, the, the country, a, a disservice, the leadership, a disservice, because, all the professional knowledge we gain in these worst places on the pulse will just die. And then, then you have people making decisions uh, from thousands of miles away uh, on policy and what we're going to do as a people without all the information. So that, that, that's, I think, if we can share what we do, what we believe in, who we are, what we've seen, 
and do it in the right way, then then hopefully we're given a gift of that information for people, you know, better than us to make good decisions off. Our sponsor for this episode of Innovation and Leadership is Skillshare. If you're not familiar with them, they're an online learning platform with over 18,000 classes on business and marketing and entrepreneurship and technology and, and lots of other classes too, illustration, think, other things I'm interested in. Um, they've given us a special offer where for listeners of our show, you can get two months for just 99 cents where you can see all these 18,000 classes, unlimited access. It's uh, skillshare.com slash leader. And I think what I like about them most is their high quality classes that are from high credibility instructors, you know, content marketing right from Contently or the one I took was uh, last was email marketing right from MailChimp where, you know, these are folks who are obviously seeing millions of other people's email marketing campaigns go out. So they, they really are kind of a high credibility source of information. So again, it's Skillshare.com slash leader. 99 cents for com- complete access to all their courses for the next two months. Uh, one last time, skillshare.com slash L E A D E R. Thanks. Yeah. You know, um, th- this year we're going to do be doing a bunch more shows on leadership in the military. And, and I feel like there's a few reasons for it, but one of them is I do feel like the movies can sometimes do a disservice because, um, there's a stereotype, uh, of drill sergeants, or there's a stereotype of uh, lack of compassion, lack of thinking, lack of, you know, the like, sometimes uh, the caricatures of folks from the military, as far as Hollywood puts it, can, can be this ready, fire, aim, violence is always the answer, you know, and I'm interested in talking about the parts that people don't get to see the real world version, you know, like, um, I was looking at, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, the description of your book, um, when you're, when you're going through and you're in, in the description for worth dying for, where you say, sometimes it's the sniper who doesn't take the shot. It's not always the guy who jumps on the grenade. Can you talk about restraint? Can you talk about, um, doing the right thing when it's not running towards gunfire? Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, the, the, the thing that's, the thing that's great and, and I think a true gift of being in the military is you get to experience, in my mind, like the full spectrum of, of um, you know, what could be offered somebody being a member of a team in leadership, followership, servant, you know, uh, focus, behavior, and um, and so on. You, you really get it all. So a lot of times the reason the drill instructor or that kind of aggressive um, you know, going after it caricature comes up is because a lot of times it's depicted in the, in the basic training level. And to be honest, those folks have a lot of power and a lot of impact in that um, phase of your experience because we're trying to get rid of the I and the individual and, and break you down. There's a reason we shave everybody's heads, put you in the same uniform and, and make you not an individual, you know, special little butterfly. You're now part of the clay that's all going to get molded together to be a new, better, greater thing or more capable thing to go do the job. So that, that, that's why that gets depicted a lot. Now, the thing that was interesting about SEAL training is we didn't have a whole lot of what I would consider to be the lunatic, screaming, maniacal instructors. And, and you know this if, if you're a parent or you've been around someone whose um, personality or, or their position you respect that you know, and I, I think your, your audience is going to know this, like you can hurt someone or get to a more intense place far more um, powerfully with a whisper than you can a scream, right? Like I mean, if, you're, if your dad yelled at you because you did something wrong, you'd take that hit. If he came over and whispered to you that he was disappointed, that would be crushing, right? So I think our teams are really good at whispering more than we are at yelling and just having a level of kind of intimacy and intensity in the things we say. You know, when instructors explain stuff in our line of work, they'd be like, look, our, our, our lessons are written in blood. Like our playbook is written in blood. Someone has probably been injured or killed 
to learn a lesson and a skill set that we're going to do hopefully better or learn from so we don't replicate that in the future. And, and that's that's pretty heavy when you hear that and realize that's where the doctrine's coming from. It's not coming from some, you know, esoteric self-help book that's telling you something that, yeah, we all know, but very few people are going to do. And, and the consequence probably aren't that great. Maybe it's losing a few pounds, gaining a few pounds. In our line of work, it's, you know, are you going to get everybody home or or not? So, um, you know, I think I, I think the 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 thing about leadership that I've found, because I know, you know, you love talking about leadership, as do I, is that the one thing I recommend to leaders that I consult with and, and mentor and help is I say, look, be the best version of leader that is your leadership style. I, I'm not for this, you know, trying to give someone a style of leadership. I mean, look, I've seen screamers that that are actually really effective leaders. They're not a lot of fun to work for, but they're effective leaders. And I've seen very cerebral, quiet um, folks that guide people in a way and they've been effective leaders. And then I've seen both of those personality types utterly fail and grenade. So it really comes down to your ability to connect as a leader and, and use your style to the maximum on behalf of your people. The, the thing you figure out in the military that I think the military maybe gets better than anybody else. And we're not perfect. We by no means have everybody operating at, uh, uh you know, batting a thousand, but, I think what we figured out very, very early on, or I figured out very early on, is the higher you go up the chain of command, the more power you wield and the more status you gain, the more people you should be in service to. And, and I don't think there's a lot of corporate world that, that gets that as much. Seems like the further you go out in that C-suite office, the more you've now achieved, your paycheck goes up and you, you kind of can wield power. For us, the paycheck's so small anyway, it doesn't really matter. So now it's like, okay, to be effective as a, as a senior person, the best of them are the ones that take care of their troops, that take care of their people. Yeah, and I know we're, we're getting closer on the ending of, of part one of the interview here, but maybe this is a, a good subject to, to discuss for the last couple of minutes of it. Um, can you talk about, as a leader that temptation to, um, or just any thoughts you have on, <clears throat> you know, when you do, when you do rise up in position, the, the natural human dynamics of any group of people is you start to get treated different. Right. Yeah. And so I, I just think about myself. I was a pretty young guy. I was 28 when I became the CEO of my own private equity fund. And wow. yeah. I, I had some, I had some, maybe some insecurities that I really wanted people to think I was a big deal, you know? And, yeah. and so I think if you, there's any of that temptation, when people do treat you different, um, and they, you know, the meeting doesn't start till you get there and just, you know, life, life is different when you're in charge. For and, sure. and, um, if you have any desire at all to feel special, there's all sorts of evidence to let you know you are, yeah, yeah. um, uh, is there anything that you tell yourself or is there a mentor you've had or somebody you look up to that, that maybe gave you some advice on, um, on how to recognize like the privilege of rank is the privilege to serve? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's a, it's a vital part of effective leaders and obviously, you know, kind of one of those foundational building blocks to figure this out early in your career. The beauty about being in the SEAL teams is we have somehow managed to figure out a way within that that culture, and this is another one of those great culture kind of focused concepts, is to keep a tremendous um, level of kind of almost like Viking honesty within each other to kind of keep people in check. The, 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 if you put a senior SEAL admiral, so let's say like a two or three star admiral up to a four star admiral, and you got a very, very you know, junior officer or, or better yet, somebody that maybe they went through training with much earlier in their career um, that's still junior. And a lot of times you'll see this in guys that have gotten out and maybe come back in. So let's say you have these huge disparity in rank, right? You got a four star admiral, but you got a guy that maybe went through buds, basic training with that admiral was in his boat crew and he was just a brand new officer. And then maybe he got out for 15 years, did something else. And now has come back in to serve because he loves it. So he's a, you know, he's not even a chief petty officer. If they run into each other, I mean, that young guy will often be like, oh, that's just Bill, you know, and then everybody in the room will be like, you know, that is Admiral Bill to you. And then he'll be like, nah, that's just Bill. I saw him screw it up at, at, at you know, this evolution, that evolution. Something about our community wears that well. I mean, usually the guy would know I'm not going to do that if we're 
you know, in front of a bunch of sister services. I'm not going to do that if he's in a formal event and kind of dress him down. And that's not what I mean. But we have this level of kind of um, keeping each other in check that I, I think is unique amongst many organizations. And I, I think what it does is it keeps senior folks, officer and enlisted, you know, sort of in check and sort of on the pulse of the, the young folks coming in and keeps them connected um, so that you don't go so disassociated and disconnected from – um, you know, what the boys are experiencing on the battlefield or in basic training or trying to get the gear they need to do their job compared to you living in the ivory tower or somebody bringing you coffee the way you want it, making sure your uniforms are pressed and getting you to the next meeting on time. We're really good about that. And that, that's, I think if you could, if you could create that in other cultures, um, you, you'd knock people down a couple rungs in a, in a healthy way, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I'm, you know, we're all humans. We all do good on that kind of stuff sometimes and we mess it up sometimes. Um, just being human. I'm interested if there's any specifics of like, um, you know, over, you know, 19 years uh, serving your country, the times when it's gotten away from you. What does what your look in the mirror look like? Or what, what's, do you have any phrase you tell yourself? Do you have anything to, like, how do you have your own kind of canary in the coal mine of man? Like Rourke, reel it in, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think when well, when I find myself, I love to talk. So I mean, from time to time, I can find myself getting long winded when I'm talking to young folks and, you know, giving them guidance or advice or my thoughts on things. And I, I, try, I try and sometimes cut myself off because I feel like I can keep going. I, I try and always keep that that what I said earlier, that, that the higher I go up the chain of command, that means the more people I have an opportunity to take care of. It gives me more position to create a good situation for those at the bottom of the ladder as opposed to what I can do for myself at the top of the ladder or wherever I where I'm sitting I mean by no means am I at the top of the ladder uh nor will I probably ever be in in, in certainly in the military side um I don't have any mnemonics or I think devices that I'm using every day to kind of make sure I'm there I mean the fact of the matter is I've enjoyed it my personality type likes having command I like having the ball when the game's on the line but what I've realized early on is do that by having the best people around you. And look, if I, I would say the, the best thing I can do as a senior officer is get an assist, right? Like instead of scoring the goal, can I, can I put a nice pass over to a younger guy, another gal that's working in another operation or, or a unit to let them, you know, get the goal. So if I could assist more than I could get the final goal, um, that'd be a definite win for me. Yeah. What about the rest of us who, who are tempted to want to get the goal? And any advice for us on how to conquer ourselves and and recognize the long term benefit for this organization is me bringing more people up by doing the assist rather than scoring the goal myself? Yeah, I mean, I think that's you know that's one of the blessings of being an athlete is is, is I'm talking about that you, you know almost as a uh, as an example, but I also played sports enough to know it's real. I mean, I think I think you need to be able to do both, right? I mean, there's a time when it's like, look, you you have the ball, there's an open shot, take the shot. So so you're going to get the goal. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of people that just aren't willing to shoot, right? So so I'd say for those coming up, or those that want to be in the position to to score and get to those those top spots, don't be willing to take a shot or, or be willing to take a shot. You know, I mean, that's my dad. I remember had a great line. Uh, he was at a basketball game with one of his good buddies. His good buddy's son is playing basketball, small time, but D1 basketball. So good basketball. And they're up watching a game. They're kind of high in the stands watching. And this, this, my dad's buddy's son got in the game and was young. I mean, it was like kind of an early time. He wasn't a starter yet, but he somehow finds himself loose and open on the baseline. This is hoops. He gets a pass over to him. The defender is coming out, but hasn't closed the distance yet. He kind of does the little, you know, he, he goes to shoot and then thinks about it for a second, goes to shoot again, then thinks for a second, and then he's kind of caught. And I guess the dad, the dad in the stands next to my dad is like, shoot it or don't shoot it, but don't F around with it. But he used the full <laughs> word. And it's like, that's really what it is all about in this life, right? Like either do or don't do. But don't like screw around with it. You know, it's it's good to take a shot. If you miss, you miss. If you don't take a shot, you don't even have a shot of being in the game. You know, so I, I like people that are willing to shoot. I like people that are willing to shoot. Yeah. And what about that that balance beam of the like, hey, recognize when it's my team to lead from when it's my turn to lead from in front, to be decisive, and when I do recognize ah, it's probably. I, I would like the adulation of being the one to take the shot, but the right thing for the team is to give the assist and any advice yeah. for the rest of us of like, do what you think you should do instead of what you feel like doing. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, well, you, you kind of said it, but what, what, what I would say is, what what I'd hope to see is somebody that as they move up that chain is that they've they've scored a run, right? They've had the wins, they've had those victories. You got the accolades for that. And that, that happens in your military career because you're in these operational windows when you're genuinely young. That's when you're gonna win you, you know, win big awards and win acclaim. And then, you know, when you get to this command level or a place when the young lions are then, you know, going faster than you, moving quicker than you and kind of have the ability to, to win, th- then you're moving into assist world. You know, you're kind of that gray beard that has an opportunity to say, you know what, I've taken plenty of shots. It's time to, you, you know, take some heat, take the fire, pass the ball off to somebody that's in the open and let them shoot the ball. I, I think I think it's the ability to have, um, you know, the thick skin that you develop through the fighting years to say, okay, now I've got rhino or dragon skin. I can take the heat. Um, so if the things go well with my team, I can give all that credit away. I can let my team know that they won the day. If things go south, I can take all the blame. E- even if I didn't screw it up, hey, if you're if you're signing the check, if it went wrong, you screwed it up, whether you did or not. So you know, own that and make sure you got your troops' backs to to move forward. So um, you know, you know, hopefully you develop enough um, experience and time. You know, taking those shots and, and getting some victories stacked up that it doesn't become hard to pass the ball off. And I, I'm at that point in my career, I'm, I'm happy to give the ball off to people. And, and, uh, you know, I, I still want to, I still want to log a few more goals and some f- few notches in my gun belt, but I'm, I'm very, very happy, um, to make sure my team gets the credit when we do it. I think that's a great place to end part one here. I, I think my favorite thing you just said there is this, this idea to take that ultimate responsibility and own it, I think is what you said. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's, yeah. I think it's a great place to end. Well, thanks for making time, everybody. Make sure to listen to uh, the, the second half of the episode. We're going to get more of this wisdom from Rourke. Thanks for thanks for making time again here, Rourke. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, that's it for the episode. One other thing I wanted to tell you about, if you remember the guys from Convoy uh, in episodes back, Ken Free and Trent Mano, I went on one of their CEO trips to New York, and I met a guy named Brent Thompson, very successful entrepreneur. He was former CEO of Jive Communications, big uh company now, I think three or $400 million. Anyways, he, uh, he started a new company called blipbillboards.com. I'm super stoked they're a sponsor now, but I, I remember a year and some ago when I met him, I thought it was genius. Instead of having to buy six months or a year's worth of billboard, um, for thousands of dollars, you can buy eight seconds at a time for like 10 or 20 cents. You pick what billboard you want it on, what time of day you want it to run. And it just puts so much power in the hands of of marketers and CEOs who want to try something and see if it works. You can buy as many or as few as you want, change it as many times as you want. Uh, I think now our podcast is being advertised on billboards in like 18 different states because we have these guys as sponsors. We're pretty excited about it. Hope you check out blipbillboards.com. Thanks.